I want to very warmly welcome you to the, the SBA lunch break seminar, uh, webinar for February. You may think that you're seeing a ghost, and in a way you are. I, of course, am Susan Holson. I retired back in January, but I'm helping out today with the webinar on successful communications. I'm joined today, as always, by Carrie Lamb, who is Mission Control. She's holding down the fort. So if you have any technical difficulties, that's Carrie's cell phone number on this slide, and she'll help you offline. She's also going to be monitoring the chat here. So as you have questions, if you have questions or comments, please feel free to just chime in. We're going to keep this casual, um, but we are taping it for future resource. What often happens in, edu in, in communication is everybody's talking and nobody's listening and, and people are, are not taking time to make sense out of what they're hearing. And I'm sure that you have all been in this situation in, in, in various parts of your lives, not just your board work, but with a lot of different people in a lot of different positions, providing a lot of information, it can become a whole lot of white noise and nobody's really hearing anything. So when we're talking about effective communication, it really should be strategic from, from the board and to the board with everybody on message. And these four guiding actions down at the bottom of this slide, inform, educate, engage, listen, and learn, apply to all communications, really, in any walk of life, but especially among board members, between board members, and also with district personnel, including the superintendent, and of course, with your communities as well. Um, so uh, it, just to put this all in perspective, there's sort of a hierarchy of effectiveness. And it, it starts at the top of the food chain, if you will, as face-to-face, one-on-one communication. That's going to be the most effective communication. You're going to choose your words most carefully, and you're also going to stop and listen to the other participant. And as that group expands, it becomes a little bit less effective. So a small group discussion or meeting versus a large group, and then we go from personal interaction to written interaction. And this slide is a, probably a little out of date. I would stick our virtual communication in the middle there. I think it's not quite as effective as face-to-face, -face, but at this point, we're all getting so used to it that it's, um, it's pretty useful. And the more people you try to reach with a given piece of information in any form, the less effective it becomes. So if you're talking in newspapers and television and radio, you're giving a mass audience a message, which is really different than having a one-on-one -on -one conversation, obviously. What communication outlets are we really talking about? Well, there's personal conversation, and that is aligned with the previous slide, um, where that is really the most effective. And then there's email, and we're all bombarded with them on a daily basis, and certainly your board work is also probably held together with email communication. There's social media and traditional media. All of those things go into the mix of how to communicate well with your communities, with your stakeholders, and with each other as board members. Uh, so one of the fundamental principles here is that the board speaks with one voice. And that's a, a statutory thing, and we'll talk about that. But what does that really mean? It, well, so as I say, it is statutory, and there's really clear evidence in the statutes that individual board members have no special power or authority. The authority comes by being a member of the board. It's the board that has the authority. So as a board member, you can voice your individual opinions and provide your input during the discussion periods of a given issue at your board table. That's the appropriate time to share your personal views. 
But once an item is voted on, it's really incumbent on everybody on the board to accept that that was the voice of the majority of board members. We still function as a majority, uh, as a democracy here. And that means that the majority rules, if you will. Um, and finally, in terms of any kind of outward, outbound communication that ensues around that decision, we strongly recommend that your board select a board spokesperson, one person who will be the point person for all communications with, and particularly from the board, assuring that the board really has consistency and continuity with whatever information you're sharing. Um, that person, that spokesperson is often the board chair chosen by the whole group at the whole board at your reorganizational meeting right after well when your new board members are seated for the first time typically that would be in late march early april for most boards um, and we do encourage that you have that conversation and develop that understanding now before i have 18 questions in in the chat box a lot of board members really struggle with the what seems like a, a opposition between this one voice notion for the board and First Amendment rights as a private citizen. And, and it feels sometimes like those two things are actually in conflict. And I guess in a way they are. I mean, as a private citizen, you're still able to say whatever you can say that's protected under the First Amendment. But as a board member, and I, I, I'm gonna remind you, you're a powerless board member when you're acting as one person, then you're really ethically bound to subscribe to that one voice principle and the actions that the board takes. So it's okay to say, well, you know, as, as you know, that wasn't my, approach going into this, but that's the way the board chose to go on this issue, and I will respect that. So it's okay to acknowledge that it, it wasn't your choice, but you have to then also go on to support it. And I know we talk a lot about open meeting law, and I just want to say that we have done a lot of training on open meeting law. There's a great webinar in the archives back from May of 2020, um, where Sue Siglowski, the executive director of VSBA, and Chris Withers, who is the, I think his title is assistant secretary of state, maybe associate deputy, I don't remember exactly. Um, but the two of them go through open meeting law and it's, um, purposes and its practices. So I will direct you there, but, and today we're gonna keep the open meeting discussion really focused on how it impacts communication to and from the board and within the board. Um, but clearly the purpose of the open meeting law is to provide transparency to the public for the um, benefit of making sure that taxpayers know what's happening in public institutions. And that includes any elected body in the state of Vermont, any official body as your school board is. And so then the question is, when does the open meeting law apply? And this is as deep as I wanna get here, but it's any time a quorum holds a meeting. And what that means is a majority of the entire public body, and that could be your board, and that can be your committees, um, has a gathering for the purpose of discussing business or taking action. So if five of your seven board members happen to meet in the post office, you gotta be really careful about what you're gonna talk about in that context. Um, and I have a little note on this slide. 
the Vermont League of Cities and Towns has a really good FAQ on their website about the laws, open meeting laws and, and how they apply to public bodies. Some of them are not specifically germane to school boards. They talk more about municipal boards and the like, but it, it's really, I find that's a really helpful place to go to get a quick answer, and qu question and answer session. Okay, Carrie, let's move on. So electronic communications between board members or board committee members, this is something that seems to be out of date with the way we live right now. However, it is enshrined in the open meeting law in the interest of public transparency. So at the moment, you are still obligated to comply with this. So remember that group emails involving a quorum of the public body, it may not discuss the body's business. So it's okay to send out an email for the board chair, for example, to send out an email um, with a draft agenda and reminder of board time uh, meeting dates, but that's about the extent of it. And, and any response to that may be starting to tread on the business of the board. And so you wanna be really careful about that. Uh, a couple of helpful tips here um, for those of you who are chairs who or and send out communication to your full board, uh, we recommend that you send them out as BCCs, that's the old uh, blind carbon copy. Um, that way, the recipients cannot accidentally reply all. And by doing it that way, you're making sure that no business is transpiring in that chain of emails that is going to all board members. Um, another thing that is unacceptable with the open meeting law, and I get questions about this a lot, is collective editing of an online document by a quorum. So this in many cases pertains more to committees even than the full board. But if a committee is trying to pull its, <coughs> excuse me, its findings together to report back to the board and wants to issue a report on the findings, it cannot be worked on simultaneously by all of you separately. It has to be at a warned meeting. And similarly, participation in a social media group or front porch forum even by a quorum of the board is potentially a violation of open meeting law if the body's business is discussed. And this is something to be mindful of um, it now in, it, as we're getting ready for town meeting and there may be discussions of budgets popping up on front porch forum, for example, uh, stay out of it. <laughs> because even if you think you're responding as a private citizen, your community knows you as a board member and perception is hugely important in all of this. So if it is perceived that a board member is chiming in, say, to support the budget, you are in violation right there. So just steer, be extra cautious with those digital groups, those online groups. So here's some good guidelines. And I know this may feel very um, con constraining and that it is unfortunate that that is the case sometimes, but it's in the interest of making sure that the public has access to all of the board's actions and discussions. So don't text, email, blog, tweet, or post anything that you don't want to see on the front page of the newspaper. You are a publicly elected official, and anything that you text, email, blog, tweet, or post is therefore sub part of public records. And 
thus is and may show up on the front page of the newspaper. It's not um, needing to be verified you're a public officer. Don't disclose executive session materials or protect protected information via email. Again, once it's committed to writing, it becomes public record. And executive session by its very nature is confidential. So take proactive steps to ensure that the quor a quorum of the board is not participating in an online discussion. And one of those proactive steps is having a singular board member be the representative for the board, the spokesperson. Understand how your district policies apply to electronic communications. And that often is as much about um, school, well, students and school personnel but also has implications for the board and protect your personal email. And I can't stress this enough. It, it seems like a headache for a lot of people to actually use your school district email. But when you are elected to your board, you should be issued an email through your school district. By using that email, for all board related business and only board related business, you are able to isolate your communications that are a public record from your personal communications, which are not a public record. If you don't separate those out that way and some public records request is made, you may have to surrender all of your emails, including your personal emails, um, and, and that just feels like a real invasion of privacy and something you can prevent. Um, so for those of you who are maybe not as tech comfortable, most email um, platforms allow you to forward from one address to another. So even if you don't want to be checking two different places for all your email, you can channel it all into the same place. Just be mindful that you are receiving all of your board email to your board address, and especially that you are issuing all email relating to board work from that board address. Susan, we have a question. Sure. Um, what about the board chair forwarding a letter from a community member that is addressed to the board? BCC, of course. The problem is that it then becomes a matter of public record. So if this is a letter that is something that that individual could bring up at a board meeting during public comment, say, then it would be appropriate. If it's a a sensitive issue that re would normally require some sort of um, would would re require an executive session because you're talking about specific students or um, a specific incident that may fit under the executive session parameters. Then I. I think then the better way to handle that is to share a hard copy of that letter at the meeting rather than sending it through email, which is not protected and not private. So executive session is something that a lot of boards don't fully understand and often misuse. The point of executive session is not to um, isolate the board when you're having a difficult conversation so that you don't have to have that in public. There are 14 statutory categories that allow executive session. Remember, executive session is assumed to be confidential. Um, and those are spelled out either in that webinar that I mentioned earlier, the Secretary of State's office has them, and they're also on our website. Um, if the board has a legitimate executive session need, 
the public body, the board must vote to enter executive session while you're still in open session and indicate the reason for doing so. That means identify which of those 14 statutory categories. And we recommend using that statutory language right in your motion um, as a way to ensure that you are following the letter of the law. Um, and a, a majority of the board needs to approve that motion to enter executive session and that motion gets recorded in your minutes. When you're preparing a, a, an agenda, if there's a question about your desire to have a portion of your meeting in executive session, a session, we recommend that you consult with your legal counsel to make sure that it's permissible and also to uh, be, be able to identify which provision you're applying of those 14 statutory categories. Um, the, it's while you're in executive session, then the board may only discuss the matter that was referenced in the motion. And the board gets to decide who attends that executive session. So depending on what it's about, you may request that your attorney is present, that some certain staff members Often the superintendent is present and anyone who's the subject of discussion or whose information is needed may also be invited into executive session. Minutes are not required in executive session and we recommend actually that you do not take them because once you have them, they become public record. And so Listen attentively, pay attention. You cannot take any action in executive session either. So you're gonna have to adjourn executive session if there's an action that needs to be taken. And then that motion does get recorded in the minutes as does the vote. So let's talk about the public comment period. Cause when I talk to board members about communicating with the public, the first thing I hear about is, oh, well, no one ever comes to our meetings. And that may be, um, that's not the only way to communicate or hear from your public, but the public comment period is required um, and is also subject to any rules that the chair of the board chooses to implement. And what we recommend here most of all is consistency. So if you know you've got a a hotbed issue, a contentious issue coming before the board, and you anticipate a lot of public comment, then you're going to want to set up some guidelines right up front, be really clear what they are, and make sure that you uh, apply them exactly for every speaker to avoid giving any uh, impression of favoritism or supporting one view and not another. And I'll tell you anecdotally, I, I was at my homeowners association meeting just recently and the chair of the board decided he didn't want me speaking on a particular topic. And I was pretty upset and I lambasted him afterward. Now, this is not a public body and not required to comply with anything, but it, it, it was so out of line to selectively choose who can speak and with a hint of knowing what they were going to say. And it very much appeared that it, that in that example, the board chair first called on anybody who agreed with him and gave them as long as they wanted to speak. And then he cut off other people who didn't agree with him. So it was a really awkward situation. And, and it would be a total mess for a public body to be in a situation like that. But it is also really important to remember that the board meeting is the time and place that you as a board do your work. It's not a meeting of the public where they get to talk about whatever they want to talk about, however long they want to, and, and derail the entire meeting. So there are reasons to have those rules. Um, 
and a policy with those rules or, or at least allowing for that is a great thing to have in your policy manual so that it, again, shows the consistency and the fairness with which it's applied. Chairs have a lot of responsibility around public comment. One, of course, is creating those rules and, and implementing any limitations. Um, but most of all, the, the chair really needs to make sure that the public comment period is fair, efficient, and productive. So the board, the chair needs to be mindful that comments, comments that disparage an individual's professional reputation or di disclose legally protected private information or anything that could expose the school board to liability are generally out of order. And it is okay to call a member of the public on that as being out of order and, and not allowing them to complete that speech. And I know we actually had a really good webinar back in November on um, the effectiveness of board meetings. And it was put together, it was a whole um, collection of professionals from different walks of life to really specifically address contentious board meetings. Um, and if you missed that one, I strongly encourage you to go back and, and take a look at that one, um, because one of the issues that was discussed in there at some length was the public comment period. Um, I also have recently been exposed to some board meetings where board members who didn't agree with the action of the board used put themselves on the list for public comment period so that they could criticize the board. That's completely inappropriate. The board members have the first opportunity to speak. They speak directly to one another. And until there's been a vote, they are free to express their own opinions. And there's no time at which a board member should be recognized during public comment period for the purpose of advancing a point of view. We have a couple of questions, Susan. Please go ahead. Okay, first one is, is it okay to discuss budget issues face-to-face -face with community members or direct them to, to the chair or, next, or to the next board meeting? I'd say it depends um, what you mean by discussing budget issues. If you are sharing information as it transpired at a previously open meeting that was warned for which there are minutes, that's fine to share that information. To um, And it's also fine if somebody decides that they wanna provide you with their thoughts on budget, that's also fine. And then that you would want to share at the, both with your chair sooner and for, at the chair's discretion with the entire board at the next meeting or the next budget discussion. Okay, the other question is, can a board create a policy on public participation at board meetings? Absolutely. Absolutely, and we encourage you to do that. And if you want some, um, you know, a, a platform to jump from, check out the model policy manual on the VSBA website. And, and I just think about this because, you know, after I hear from board members, well, very few people ever come to our meetings. So how do we know what they're thinking? Um, ask yourself, are, are the public comments at your meeting a good way to judge your community's opinions on a particular issue? Um, yeah, so I, I would be really um, cautious about using those public comments as a good barometer of the whole community's input. As you probably know, especially those of you who are longtime board veterans, the people who show up to talk to, to an issue at a meeting are the ones who are most 
passionate about it on one side or the other. And they are going to probably influence the tenor of that whole discussion with their passion. And so you need to be really mindful of the fact that generally speaking, you have a very small portion of your community coming out to speak on a singular issue and that it most likely does not reflect your whole community. Um, you tend to get the, the real advocates for one point of view or another. Uh, yes, so somebody did just say in the chat, it's hard to judge because people normally come in when they are upset about something and not because they're really happy about things. And that sadly is the truth. That's what most board members, I think, see and are aware of. And so you wanna be really careful not to extrapolate that selective um, point of view. Um, so public forums are a really good way to proactively reach out to your community for their input. Of course, you want to make sure that if you're hosting a public forum that you do attract a diverse audience that reflects your community's points of view and um, demographics even. So parents and students and other taxpayers, local businesses should all be there. And the question I have is, do your forums look like this or like this? Do you see the difference? So before you start slapping together community forums, make sure you understand what it is you're looking to accomplish. What are your goals? Do you have specific issues to address? And how will you reach out? How will you ensure accessibility and equity for participation and hear from all stakeholder groups. And most importantly, what will you do with the input? And will you let you, people who take the time out of their schedules to provide you with input, let them know how you're gonna use that and make sure that they're feeling heard. That's really important too. Um, but, too often community engagement looks like the public comment period of a board meeting, or it's the board members sitting in a row facing an audience and just talking at them. And that's really not the way you're going to get any kind of valuable input, um, except from a few people who are willing to stand up against a public body and take issue or exception or even agree with what you're talking about, um, but you're not gonna really unpack what people are thinking about a given issue. Okay, so that's all about what's going on within board meetings. I wanna switch gears here to focus a little bit more on outside of board meetings. Let's say you get an email from a parent complaining about the way her child is beating, being treated by his teacher. How do you respond to that? What do you do with that email? Really, your role here is to educate. Um, educate the person who's complaining about the chain of command and encourage them to follow it. You should also probably inform both your chair and the superintendent that you received this complaint. And then it's up to you if you want to follow up with the, if it's, you know, a good friend or a neighbor. Um, but remember that you can't really get involved in that decision at that time. Board members, one of the roles that are spelled out in statute, we serve as quasi-judicial members, uh, a quasi-judicial board, uh, when issues come up in the school district that need to be resolved. In other words, you're like a jury and a judge, all put together. Um, and the only way that you can really participate in that part of the process is to be neutral, which means uninformed in this case. So you may be aware that this Sarah has a concern about Aiden's teacher, but 
following up on it closely will really force you to recuse yourself in the event that that issue ever gets accelerated all the way to the board. Generally speaking, most districts have a policy or at least a practice that the chain of command is, you know, the first thing the parent ought to do in that case is talk to the teacher and find out if maybe there's something that together you can do to help this boy feel more welcome and comfortable in school. And if you aren't making any progress with the teacher or you feel like you're not communicating well and, and you need to bring in a third party, your next stop would be the principal or their next stop would be the principal. And they should talk to the principal if they have an issue about a teacher. And if they're not getting satisfaction there, up the line to the superintendent and you tell them that. You say, okay, if, if you're not getting what you need there, the next stop is the superintendent. But I really can't help you here because I have to remain neutral. So a neighbor stops you at the post office telling you that the proposed budget creates an unmanageable tax burden for local taxpayers. And we may not be seeing that this year from all of the indications from the state, but nonetheless, we've seen it plenty and we will again in the future. Um, and you voted against authorizing that budget but the majority of the board approved it. So what are you gonna say or do? Susan, we do have a um, response on, on our chat. Um, they said that I don't think the public understands the process. Um, they, they just want us to help them. Right, and that's why I say the help that you can offer them without violating any of your um, responsibilities as a board member is really to educate them about what the process is and, and explain to them that that is how help can come along. I agree that, and, and so does Nancy, um, that, board mem uh, that the community expects the board member to be the one who's going to hold them by the hand and walk them through this, but this is not the board's job. This is absolutely not the board's job. If there's a conflict with personnel in the school, then it has to be handled by the school personnel. A board member, you're there about policies and budgets and, and, and compliance and making sure that the outcomes are moving in the right direction. You're not there for a parent who has an issue with a teacher. And, and they just need to know that. And, and the teachers um, all, uh, okay, so I'm, I'm seeing a comment also that it's not just the parents, but comes from the teachers too, that they expect the board to intercede. And, and if necessary, it falls to board members sometimes to also educate them. Um, but if that becomes the issue, then you may also want to remind the superintendent that you're seeing that and that you'd like their help in clarifying what the board's role is and in fact what the board's role isn't uh, when it comes to working with one-on-one -on -one with a community member to resolve a complaint. Uh, much of the board's work in facing the public really is about educating them about what the board's job is. People just don't know. Um, and in fact, many board members have some misconceptions when they first join the board because they carry those with them. We really have to go back to one voice, right? Board members support the outcome of a vote regardless of their personal opinion. So even though you spoke up at a board meeting saying this is going to raise taxes too much and, and our communities just aren't going to be able to sustain this. You can acknowledge that that was your opinion, that you were outvoted, and that you now respect the process of the board enough to be able to support that budget. And, you know, certainly if community members are unhappy with the budget, they're going to vote against it. And, and you do want to avoid having your budget go down. So if that kind of input comes repeatedly from numerous sources, that would be something that you would want to um, share with 
the rest of the board as you are finalizing your budget. But once it's all set and once it's been warned, you can't go back on it. And, and the best thing that you as a board member can do in this case is again, educate. You know, I really struggled with the tax burden and it was a major issue for me as we were going through all the, the budget discussions, as you know, um, because you see it in the minutes or you attended the meetings. However, I do really appreciate the concerns of the majority who, instead of focusing on the tax burden, were really committed to improving the outcomes for our students. And I'm hopeful that by investing in that now, we'll be able to, uh, you know, really see the successes that that has brought about as we move forward and that will also have longer term um, budget relief or something along those lines. How about this one? The next week after that whole altercation at the post office, you see that someone posted something on the school's Facebook page, which of course you follow because they wanna gain momentum for movement to add more support personnel in classrooms. What do you do with that one? So we all wear a lot of different hats in our lives. And what's a real challenge for board members is that sometimes it's almost impossible to take off your board member hat and just be a parent or a taxpayer or whatever your relationship is to your community, just to be a person um, because people know that you're on the board and they see you as a public figure and they have some expectations around that, some of which are wrong, as we just talked about, some of which they need to be educated about. But nonetheless, they have those assumptions. And so you might be smart to make the assumption that you will always be viewed as a board member and thus, Whenever you're speaking in a less personal way, so at a meeting or on social media, you have to remember that it's perceived that you are speaking and acting as a board member. If you're face to face with somebody or even a small group, it's much easier to say, listen, we all know I'm a member of the board. I'm taking off my board hat here. I'm just as an individual citizen, let's talk about this. But as you go down that hierarchy list that I showed earlier, it's harder and harder to do that. And it's almost impossible sometimes to do that effectively. So be, be really wary and careful about your comments here because you don't wanna get involved in an online discussion about school business. That's encroaching <laughs> on open meeting law, especially because I'm gonna guess most board members are following this group. So you all are participating. Not to mention the fact that in this particular example, staffing and staffing levels are really administrative decisions. So the board shouldn't be chiming in at all other than uh, directly with your administration because this then becomes a matter of resource allocation or budgeting. It's okay to monitor these discussions without chiming in just so you understand yet another group's input on issues that are relevant. You also can assume that somebody in administration is also monitoring this page and thus re responding or reacting appropriately. And if a board response is indicated on some other type of issue, it should only come from that officially designated spokesperson. And this one's slightly different because this is the friends of the school. And by the way, I have just arbitrarily selected, this is friends of Montpelier schools in the previous 
scenario was Peachum. These are not real situations from these. I've just pulled these particular examples for their visuals. So there's this group on Facebook that calls itself Friends of Montpelier Schools. And it looks like it's very open and welcoming from its cover photo and all of that. But as you go through the discussion, um, there's a heated discussion happening here within the group about what students are learning in social studies. And you have really strong feelings about this. So what actions do you take? So yeah, refrain from engaging in these kinds of unofficial social media groups. They can be really toxic. Um, they don't represent the whole community. They're often closed groups, uh, meaning that whoever set them up has to let you in. And they may be doing that selectively to protect specific agendas that they, they as a group have. Um, so don't get involved with these groups. If you, if you feel it's important to monitor them, that's okay, but do not chime in. Okay, we can go to the next slide now. So here's one of those situations where, um, you know, a parent from, East Lake School and Community Watch Group, which is not the official school group, um, is freaking out about all of the inconsistencies and the co apparent contradictions that were coming with COVID-19 from the Agency of Education and the Health Department that, and the way the schools were managing it. So now you chime in and say, well, the whole state's trying to make it safe to be in school. And the governor said public school is a need. So you're a school board member. Your participation is now a matter of public record. And anyone who responds after that is also now a matter of public record. So if a quorum of your school board are members of this group, and board business gets into it, as this in a way does, um, you run the risk of actually having what open meeting law would call an unwarned meeting. So that's a really good reason to just take a back seat and watch what's going on and don't get involved directly. And I think the answer to this is social media, a good way to judge the community's opinions. I think the, I hope that the answer is pretty clear here that just like the email or the public comment period only reflects a, a single, singular view, so too social media does not include everybody. And so you're not getting a really fair and representative response from your community to say, well, the people in the community believe blah, blah, blah. Not, not the case. And so here I'm just leaving myself open to questions. We have a couple more minutes. If anyone has any questions that you haven't asked already, please chime into the chat. We're happy to take those. Okay, and I'll just move ahead, but please, we'll keep, we'll keep monitoring the chat, so please keep typing if you're working on that. And I just want to thank you very much for joining us today. I know um, the weather is playing a factor in most of our lives, and um, we just wanted to share that as I mentioned at the beginning, I'm, I am emeritus here. I'm no longer with the SBA. I miss all of you and I miss them. Um, but my replacement, Phil Gore, will be coming in, I believe, mid-March, if that's still accurate. And he's very much looking forward to getting to know all of you and working with your boards. Um, and in the meantime and forever after, the rest of the VSBA staff, of course, is also here to help. There is a question in the chat, chat, excuse me, if I feel there is a real issue, is it okay to take it to your board chair or superintendent? Absolutely. And I would recommend that you go through the board chair, who is probably more 
uh, regularly in contact with the superintendent and can then consolidate all of those issues that they may be receiving from other board members as well. And they may also be in a position to address the issue directly without having to go to the superintendent. And so it's a good idea to leave it to them to make that judgment. But you your communication with your board chair should always be um, comfortable and open. So I hope that this was helpful. And if you have any lingering questions, please send them on to Carrie. And if she wants to run them past me, we will com communicate on them, but um, otherwise you'll get your answers soon. Well, either way, you'll get your answers soon. And again, thank you for being here today. And personally, I just wanna thank you for a really excellent four and a half years that I spent with VSBA. And I wish you all continued um, good luck in the work that you're doing for your students and thank you for being there for them.